morning, everyone. Um, so uh, I put up my uh, information. That's my Twitter handle. Raise your hand if you're on the Fediverse on Mastodon or uh, quite a few people. You might want to uh, check it out. It's a great way to uh, communicate. That's an alternative to Twitter. Uh, so my name is Karen. The, uh, one of the main things that you need to know about me is that I have a big heart. I literally have a big heart. <laughs> uh, my heart is three times the size of a normal person's heart. It's uh, extra thick, actually. It's called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, it's also obstructed. Um, and what that means is that I'm generally fine. I'm generally asymptomatic, but I am at a very high risk of suddenly dying. Uh, don't worry, I, I see some highly alarmed faces in the audience. <laughs> it is statistically very improbable that I will die right now. Um, <laughs> um, and so I, you know, it's, uh, it's yes, uh, I have a little joke. Somebody set us up the bomb uh, about the, the fact that my heart could, uh, uh, could, could go into, in the medical term, is, is actually called sudden death. Um, and uh, it's all fine because I, when I found out about this, uh, it was coincidental to other medical issues that I was having. I had a heart murmur, and so I went to the cardiologist, and I also found out that I happened to have uh, this condition. And so finding out about it in advance is, is pretty great. The electrophysiologists say, no problem. Um, if, uh, if you simply get a defibrillator, you, um, you'll, you'll be fine because you'll have this device that's in your body that will monitor your your heart rate, and if you go into sudden death, it will shock you, and you'll be fine. And, um, and this is wonderful technology. And of course, when I'm in the electrophysiologist's office, and he slides this over to me, um, which they do, they have all these devices in their desks, um, and they, they, they give them to patients to, to look at so that they see that it's a small device, that it's not so scary. And so he, he looks at me expectantly, um, you know, almost like, isn't it cute? And, um, and of course, what I say to him is, what does it run? Right? Because of course, I'm going to put this thing in my body and I want to know what is the software that is literally going to be sewn into my body and connected to my heart. And he said, software. <laughs> and this began this long journey for me of explaining to people in the medical industry that there are, you know, that these devices operate due to software, what that means, and why they should care about it. The thing that struck me is that my electrophysiologist had implanted thousands of these devices, and he had not considered the impact of the technology that he was sewing into his patients' bodies, nor did the representatives from the device manufacturers that were helping these doctors and that I, I, I talked to. So of course, you know, my first request was to ask for the source code. That did not go very well, as you might imagine. Um, but, um, but over time, I realized that uh, after years of putting off um, getting the device because it was so, it, it freaked me out to have technology in my body that I couldn't review, um, I realized that that was pretty silly because you really have to prioritize your health. Um, uh, a tip to anybody in the audience, if you're putting off a medical condition because you think it's going to be fine and you just don't want to think about it, uh, don't do that. <laughs> um, and so I, I, I took that advice from, uh, from a friend of mine who, uh, who I had brunch with and she started crying and she said, you know, how can you be putting off this device because you can't see the source code? That is absolutely ridiculous. You're going you're gonna to die because you, you're putting this off. Anyway, so I said that she was right and I decided that what I needed to do was to get the device but to launch a research project on the safety and efficacy of these devices. And what I found will not surprise anybody here in this room, which is that software has bugs. Um, the, uh, the Software Engineering Institute estimates that for every, one, uh, for every 100 lines of code, one bug is introduced, which uh, even if you ca catch the vast majority of bugs in most software, that's still a lot of bugs. Um, I also uh, found out about how, uh, how vulnerable all of our devices are. And I tell you, while I started doing all this research, I kept having to put it away and take a break from it because it was so depressing as I found out how vulnerable all of these devices are, especially medical devices that are being implanted in people's bodies. So, uh, and, uh, and so what I, what I, I loved was about some of these, uh, 
uh, uh, vulnerabilities is that, uh, is, is that uh, so this, I wasn't just looking at, at medical device vulnerabilities, I also looked at some other um, exploits and, uh, and especially from white hat hackers. And I loved this study in particular because uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a car hack. And as you can see, this is like a car dashboard and people are smiling because you're probably seeing the, the notice on the dashboard which says that uh, it's been pwned. Uh, which is, is cool, but you may not have already noticed that it thinks it's going 140 miles per hour, but it also thinks it's in park. Um, so the average car, the average luxury car has about 100 million lines of code in it, which means that if we look at the Software Engineering Institute's estimate, that's like 1 million defects. That's a lot of defects. Um, and so all of this made me uh, uh, it really was very eye-opening. And what I realized is that we have the worst of both worlds in our, um, in our medical devices world and in our critical technology world. We have a situation where we are not putting, uh, we, we have very poor security on a lot of these devices um, as evidenced by all of the uh, exploits of uh, the colorful ones that have been uh, made a lot of press. Um, and it seems like Every month, there's a new one, um, uh, and at the same time, we are fo we've we've our critical technology is proprietary. I could not have uh, agreed more with Christian's talk um, just just now, where he talked about the the, the corporate interests and um, and you know how the technology uh, works out. Um, and so uh, and so for me, looking at all of this. I, I started working on a paper, and so I, I published that. That was a long time ago already, in 2010. Um, and I, I published this paper focused on the transparency component of it, on the, the, just the, the ability to review the source code, because I felt like if I couldn't review the code in my own body, how could I ever know it was safe? And I was really focused on this issue that we needed third parties, especially academic institutions, to be able to systematically look at the software that's being deployed. And, um, and, and for me, this was, uh, this was really increased when um, early on in having my defibrillator, I was at the gym on the rower, and, uh, and I hadn't realized that my uh, defibrillator was, uh, was not precisely calibrated when I first got it, because well, you would never know, you know, you just rely on your medical professional to do that. And, um, and it was set a little too sensitively, and so I, when I was on the rower, it thought that my heart rate was twice of what it was, and so I got unnecessarily shocked. And, uh, which, you know, which was very unpleasant, but luckily if you're on a rower, you're sitting down, so, uh, so that was pretty good. Um, and, um, and ultimately, it, it sort of brought all of these things together for me, and, um, and I realized that uh, I realized that this issue was something that, that I, I was going to be passionate about, and I needed to be able to see myself how the device was calibrated in order for me to take ownership of my own situation, because I know my life the best. I know, you know, what happens to me at the gym. Um, and so for me, I, I published this paper that was really focused on why free and open source software was important from a transparency perspective. But then I continued to live with my device. And so this is a picture of me almost nine months pregnant. Um, and, um, and when I was pregnant, uh, so this is many years later after uh, I first got my device and that initial shock. And when I was pregnant, um, about, I don't know how much you, this crowd knows about pregnancy, but there are about, 25%, so about a quarter, some people say a half of all pregnant women have heart palpitations. It's like a very common, okay, see a lot of people nodding here, okay. So uh, it's a very, very common symptom. When you're, when you're pregnant, it's the stress of the body and there's palpitations. It's not a big deal. But, uh, and if, you're, if you have a normal uh, health situation and you go to the doctor and you're pregnant and you say, my heart, I feel my heart's beating weird, They'll say, oh, don't worry, that's normal, that's palpitations. If they don't resolve themselves quickly, let me know and we'll talk about it. We'll see if we need anything to do for that. But for me, because I had a defibrillator, my heart, my defibrillator thought that my heart was in a dangerous rhythm and it thought that I was in sudden death. 
And so it shocked me unnecessarily twice, just for being pregnant, basically. And this was very upsetting, as you might imagine, <laughs> um, very distressing. And when I went to my cardiologists about it, um, what they said was, this is no problem because what we'll do is we'll just increase your heart medication. So I'm on this preventative heart medication. Every time my heart beats, it, it like damages itself a little bit. Um, and so I'm on, this, uh, I'm on a drug that just keeps, it, keep, keeps my heart rate a little bit slower. And so to solve this problem, they said, we're just going to uh, more than double this medication so that your heart will beat so slowly that this won't be a problem which meant that it was very difficult for me to even climb up a flight of stairs. So it was like a very dramatic, and the drug was safe for fetuses. It's one of the drugs that's used widely for a number of, um, of conditions. So that part was safe, but it dawned on me that I was getting this huge amount of drugs simply to prevent my device from giving me unnecessary treatment. So to prevent my life-saving device from harming me, I had to take all these drugs I didn't need. It was pretty weird. And I thought, this can't be right. How can this possibly be right? And then I did some research. And I found out that of all the people who get pacemaker defibrillators, only 15% are under the age of 65. Of all of the people who get pacemaker defibrillators, only 40% are women. So the set of people, so so the number of women that could be pregnant that have defibrillators is tiny. The number, the set of women who are pregnant with defibrillators is absolutely tiny. And then on top of that, being pregnant is a temporary condition, right? Only a quarter, maybe, of women have palpitations. So my use case simply wasn't a use case that was anticipated by the manufacturer. These device manufacturers do not want pregnant ladies getting shocked unnecessarily. That is literally the last thing they want. What terrible press. <laughs> Plus, also, I think everyone in the medical industry, you know, nobody wants pregnant ladies getting shocked. That's pretty bad. Um, but, uh, but because they hadn't thought about my use case, they hadn't anticipated how I might be using the technology, there was this, you know, it, it fell through the cracks. Now, this only became an issue during the end of my pregnancy, right? Eventually, um, I had the baby, everything was fine. I had the baby, <laughs> cheer. Uh, I had the baby and, and then I went back to my normal state and this wasn't an issue for me, right? But it was so, poignant for me to realize that through no ill will of anyone, my situation wasn't the situation that the manufacturer had in mind. I was an edge case. I also realized that my current defibrillator lasts for 17 years, potentially. They, they're very, uh, the sales rep is very uh, enthusiastic about the battery life of the, of the device that I have now. Um, and I think about what could happen, and I, I just got it replaced two years ago. So what could happen in the next 15 years that wasn't anticipated? If, if they hadn't anticipated me being pregnant, right? what else could there be that I'm going to encounter that hasn't been anticipated? And as we live with all of these devices and we integrate them into our lives in different ways, what will the implications of that be? You know? And so uh, it, it's, it's, it's it really was very eye-opening for me because um, it made me realize that even with the best of intentions, there's a mismatch between what we're using our technology for and, um, you know, and, uh, and, and what it's been designed for and what we can expect down the road. This is going to have all kinds of implications as our software is in everything. Uh, this is a slide that, uh, that just uh, refers to a study about how self-driving cars are, are more likely to run you over if you are black. Um, the one of the um, and so so where our software is life and death, it's it's obvious that these issues are are incredibly important and um, and we, we need to anticipate all of all of these different um, um, implications. And so uh, I, I don't know if people have have seen this. Um, the, these this is a picture of a, a soap dispenser, 
And I first encountered this on uh, social media, where there are these viral videos where you can see of, um, of people trying to use soap dispensers. And what amazes me is that it's not just one, one brand of soap dispenser, it's several brands of soap dispensers. Um, and what happens is you'll see a person with uh, a, a light skin puts their hand under the soap dispenser and soap comes out as expected, they wash their hands, it's great. And then someone with dark skin puts their hand under the soap dispenser and nothing happens and they wave it around, nothing happens. They take a white paper towel and they put it on top of their hand and suddenly the soap dispenser works. This is another example where the people who made this soap dispenser clearly wanted everyone to be able to get soap, right? They wanted everyone to have clean hands, but it's also obvious that they clearly didn't have anybody testing the device who had dark skin. Like, otherwise they would have caught this fundamental problem with their technology right away. So, uh, I, you know, this stands for all kinds of, uh, of, of interesting propositions, but our, our technology must be inclusive, right? We must have everyone involved in making our technology or otherwise we're gonna miss really important, really big things. We can't simply rely on a few companies to make the technology that we rely on and expect them to get this right. It's too important but also it doesn't necessarily align with their profit motives. They're necessarily looking for their quarterly interests. And again, as Christian said, there's nothing wrong with that. That's, it, we have a lot of useful technology, a lot of useful products from the private sector, but we simply cannot leave it solely to the private sector because they're gonna miss big things like this that we as a public can, can solve. So um, these experiences made me realize that I cared so much more about the technology we rely on than I ever dreamt that I would. I mean, I went to engineering school and then went to law school. I then became a securities lawyer. I was working on like stocks and bonds. I, I was never particularly public interest focused, but having this experience with needing a medical device and realizing that it's not just, you know, it's very eye-opening to realize that your life relies on this software or on this piece of technology and then when you bring all of it together and you realize all the other software that you're relying on and how it's impossible to know, right, where we live in an internet of things, we're only as safe as our weakest link. And so, uh, you know, realizing that all of our software talks to each other and how vulnerable that is, it made me realize that I had to um, step it up. And so uh, I am now executive director of the Software Freedom Conservancy, and we're dedicated to, raise your hand if you've heard of Software Freedom Conservancy. So it's about like, like an eighth of the audience, that's cool. Uh, so we're, uh, we do a whole bunch of things. Uh, we're, uh, we're a fiscal sponsor, so we're the nonprofit home for, um, for dozens of free software projects. Um, stuff you're probably using, I'll just say maybe Git, uh, but, uh, but lots of other stuff too, um, as you can see from all of these logos. Um, and, um, and we're dedicated to supporting these uh, free and open alternatives uh, to proprietary software. We also run Outreachy, which uh, has been um, active in the OSM community. Uh, HOT has participated in Outreachy before. Raise your hand if you've heard of Outreachy. So that's like a quick, raise your hand if you have been a mentor or participant in Outreachy. Um, like two or three people, awesome. Um, Outreachy is a diversity initiative. We do remote paid internships for people who are subject to systemic bias or who are imp impacted by underrepresentation in tech. And so we have like these three month internships. Raise your hand if you've heard of Google Summer of Code. So that's like, okay, that's like three quarters of the audience. So, uh, so Outreachy is inspired by Google Summer of Code. In fact, it was started by, originally by the GNOME community because they had 181 applicants one year to Google Summer of Code and, um, and only one of them was a woman. And so they realized that they needed to do something about it. So it's, uh, it's formed sort of very similarly to Summer of Code, uh, but it's again for people who are, uh, who are subjected to sy systemic bias and are impacted by it. And so, um, and so we pair up free software communities with, uh, with participants and match them up with mentors and have them contribute. It's been pretty cool about uh, almost 600 people now have come through the program um, and it's been really successful. People who have come through the program have become leaders. It's, it's, it's pretty great. It's one of the things I'm uh, most proud that Conservancy does. 
Um, and then Conservancy also uh, is, uh, we, we also are involved in the ideological side of software freedom and to sort of help promote the ethical component of, um, of free and open source software. Uh, there was this uh, study also from 2010 that I read about uh, the honeymoon effect. I love polling the audience, so I'm, I'm sorry, but raise your hand if you've heard of the honeymoon effect. So just like two, two people. Uh, so the honeymoon effect, it's a security paper. And in this paper, um, they, didn't, they looked at, uh, at, the, at vulnerabilities and exploits in software projects. They looked at proprietary systems and they looked at, uh, at free and open source software, free and open source software systems as well. I, I put drinks that drinks on a beach that really doesn't have anything to do with the actual honeymoon effect, but we wish we, we wish it did. Um, but uh, but so so they looked. If you look at the number of bugs in a software project over time, you'll see that as you would expect, the number of bugs decreases as the project becomes more mature. Um, people fix more of the problems that are known in the project. But for systems that are, um, uh, for, but if you look at uh, at vulnerabilities instead of the number of bugs, you'll see something very surprising, or at least it was surprising um, to these researchers and until this paper was published, which is that there's this, there's what they call the honeymoon period. So there's a period of time when there are no known vulnerabilities. And so that's the flat part of the curve, right? And then, um, and so there's some amount of time and it varies and the researchers postulate that it could be for a lot of different reasons, possibly social reasons. Um, but once there is a vulnerability, it increases at an almost exponential rate. And what this tells me is that it's not necessarily today when your product, when your product first launches or your project first uh, gets published that you have to worry about the security of your project. It's at some point down the road that you have to worry. And this is just an amazing lesson because when you first launch a product at a company, oh, another poll, raise your hand if you are here because you're working in something related to OSM. Wow, it's like half, more than, like two thirds of the audience I would say. Raise your hand if you're a hobbyist. And that's uh, overlapping and I would say it's about a third. Yeah, and raise your hand, raise your hand if this is your first conference. Oh my gosh, amazing. That's like also like a, almost a third of the audience. That's really, really cool. Um, and so what this, stand, this whole proposition stands for is that it's not just when you're, so almost everybody here is working professionally in this, um, in, this in, in technology. Um, it's, it's not when you first come to market that you have to worry about security. It's down the road. It's when your relationships with your vendors are, you know, who knows, right? It's, it's when the people who originally worked on the product no longer are at the company, right? It's when things aren't fresh. It's down the road, and it tells me that we not only need to have access to our source code today, but we need to have access to it well down the road, access to all our technology, when we may not even know what's going to be happening, again, like with my defibrillator. And most importantly, we need to be able to have the software to control the, and the scripts to control installation, because we need to make sure that when our products are vulnerable, we're, we have control over them, and we can replace the software and have control of our own destiny so that this device that is in, sitting in my body doesn't just have to be replaced because it needs, because it needs an update and I can't get an update because my, um, my device manufacturer went out of business 10 years ago, right? And nobody knows where any of that source code is. Um, and this is sort of the, now, if anyone here is legally focused, they may have noticed that my reference to scripts to control installation is a reference to text in the GPL. Um, raise your hand if you have no idea what the GPL is. Like, wow, so like, yeah, that's cool. So, um, and that's awesome. Um, so that's like an eighth of the audience. So the GPL is a, is a, a GNU general public license. It's a, it's a sharing license. It's a license that says you can do whatever you want with the software, but if you make changes and distribute those changes, this is a vast oversimplification, um, you must do so under this very same license. It's share alike, as we would call it in the OSM community, um, in concept, or copy left. Um, and so originally, I was focused on transparency. I thought we just needed to be able to see the technology. Then I realized, no, we need to be able to control it. 
right? And I realized that I went from someone who thought that um, it, it didn't matter what the licenses were. It didn't matter if it were permissive or copyleft. It just mattered that we, we would be, have access to it. And now I realize that as we wrap all of our software in, um, you know, in, in other software, it matters that we actually have control. And so all of this is to say, I tried to be a purist, right? I wanted to use as much free and open source software as possible and no proprietary software. Raise your hand if you also have tried to be a purist at some times in your life. It's like also like an eighth of the audience. Once upon a time, this was like super easy to do, right? We had so much control over our technology. Um, I had one of these. Raise your hand if you had one of these. Like half the audience, like almost. Um, it was really easy to replace the software. It was easy to know what software you were running and, uh, and, and have control over it. And then things got more complicated. This is a G1 phone, um, uh, uh, the, one of the first smartphones. Uh, that Google put out. And the way that people started to use their software started to change immensely. Um, the web changed, right? This is a picture of, uh, of a screenshot from Conservancy's bank. Um, and if you have JavaScript turned off um, and you don't want to be tracked, you cannot do anything. So you cannot, basically, you cannot live in the current world and not use some proprietary software. And I keep hitting up against this over and over again. Um, you can't book a flight. Uh, you could use a rank, but you have to go every time you had a transaction. You would have to walk over to the bank. And even that is becoming harder and harder as people are used to online banking. And so we're in a situation where if you're living in the, you know, if you're doing things for yourself, you cannot, uh, you cannot, uh, uh, use only free, free software. And I try to use free software because I think it's important, it's important because I, wanna, I don't, I don't want to have to rely on proprietary software. I don't want software I can't look at, like the software in my body, right? I don't want software that could be surveilling me that I don't know about. I don't want software that could be doing any variety, that could have, you know, deals with third parties. I don't want any of that. And at the same time, I do it to make a point. Right? I do it so that anyone who wants to talk to me with proprietary platforms or who wants me to send them a doc file has to think about it for a second. Like, think about the software that you're using. And by having my personal influence in society means that there's this positive effect of just avoiding free software, right? I mean, sorry, avoiding proprietary software and only using free software. That there's like just this follow-on effect. But there's a real hypocrisy in it, right? And there's a hypocrisy that those of us who have been trying to be purists, because often it means that we push the, that proprietary software use on other people. We stopped thinking and stopped worrying about the servers and, uh, and other stuff. And that, that was really a problem. Um, and, what, and what we found is that people kept saying open source is one, open source is one, right? And we have more free and open source software than ever before. But we have less actual freedom than ever before. We have less control over our devices. And in the end, it's not about transparency. It's actually about that control. Um, the most poignant problem for me um, in trying to avoid proprietary software was mapping. Um, so uh, this is what you get if you try to use Google Maps and you have proprietary JavaScript switched off or JavaScript switched off. Which, I, it just amazes me that, uh, that we could have this, you know, when you have eliminated the JavaScript, whatever remains must be an empty page. It's just, it's, uh, it's amazing. So for so long, to stay pure, uh, this is me, uh, this is a picture of me, my navigation techniques along with a friend's, and he was using this proprietary tablet to navigate, and I was, of course, using a paper map. Um, this very night that I took this picture, I was walking around with a paper map in that city, and it rained, and my map got soggy, and I was not, I got totally lost, and what should have been a 10 minute walk took me an hour and a half, and I was an hour late to a, to a dinner, which was really, really sad. Um, but the worst part about it was that there was a time um, when my father had, there was an incident with my father, and, um, and he was, uh, and he was in the hospital, and I got a phone, from, phone call from my mother, and she said, I don't know what's happening, but I don't think there's a lot of time. Can you get here? And I said, absolutely. I live in a city where I don't own a car, um, but there are car sharing services. It was the middle of the night. I, I rented a car. I got in the car, and I said, oh, no. 
I don't know exactly where the hospital is. Am I going to miss my father dying because I won't use proprietary software? It was this horrible, poignant moment where I realized, am I making the right compromises? Is it right not to use proprietary software? When should we and when shouldn't we? And it was so upsetting. And it was, I did make it there in time. I, I didn't make any wrong turns, actually, which was fairly miraculous because I'm terrible with directions. But I don't, it doesn't matter that I'm so bad at directions because I cannot tell you the joy, the joy that I experienced when I understood where OSM is at and where Osmand is. When I realized how good it is, and more recently, and, and started using it, the joy that I felt is as intensely positive as the pain I felt in that moment and the helplessness that I felt. And so I wanted to say this huge thank you to the OSM community because you have done so much to make it possible, that, to make freedom possible, and to make real ownership of our technology possible. And so keep being so awesome. Make, thank you so much. You are the community that is giving me hope. OSM can unravel the dystopia that we are already living in. And so please help make small choices that support software freedom in your own personal usage, but make big choices. OSM is on this, in this inflection point, right? Uh, the companies that are involved have their own interests. We can stay strong as a community so that we leverage their interests so they can still have productive businesses, but on our terms and our community's terms and on the public terms. Um, help shine light on the problem so that everyone understands that these issues around control over our technology are so important to us. And thank you so much. Help support free software charities and, um, and ethical charities like Conservancy, but also like the foundations in the OSM community. Thank you so much. We, we've got time. For, we've got time for questions. I think okay. um, maybe one or two. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, lots of you here. Whether you're here for your job or your hobby, it's just great knowing that it affects lives of what we're doing and and so much. Um, so yeah, I want to. We're here for discussion as well. So I want to allow people to ask you questions. Oh, I would love that. Brilliant. Um, raise your hand if you've got a question. I've got a volunteer who will run Great. to you. I might go for the back one. Go for the back. While run, we're running run. the mic, I'm going to be here for uh, for all day today and all day tomorrow. Please don't hesitate to come and talk to me. I, I want to hear what you're working on, nope. and I, I want you to keep doing all the great stuff you're doing. Who had a Who had a question? Yeah. <laughs> so, so well, there's one up there. Why don't you? Oh yeah, you got if you at the back. If you want to go first. Okay. Thank you very much, Karen, for a highly insightful story and also a very personal story. I have a question. Actually, two questions related to that, um, and they may easily be mistaken for a nerdy teaser question. And I don't mean it that way. I mean something that really you know, ask something for the next 50 or 80 years. I, I, I would postulate that your body has much more code in it than only in your implant. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, I, I would and, say and, all of us are in the process of becoming and unbecoming cyborgs at every right, possible moment. Right, yeah. and, and you know that software was made by a two-person developer team with no formal education. <laughs> And, and it has a lot of bugs and defects. So, so clearly, one question is, aren't you bothered with that also? The second question, and the second question is, is that, is that uh, actually free software? Or is it proprietary? And what do you think about um, 50 years from now, we will be able to write software, not in code lines, but with you know the, the genetic techniques to do something about that. Yeah, I mean, I, these are all complicated questions. You know, like I, I want all of our software to be free and open in a a real way for forever. I mean, I I I think that it's the only way that we're going to be able to really have truly safe software in the long run. Software is embedded in our body in a, a whole host of ways, and I think without having that. Any any review over it is 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 is, is pretty pretty bad. Um, I would say that 
uh, I would say that the um, the fact that uh, I'm trying to it was such a big question and had so many parts to it and I um, I actually just lost my train of thought I'm sorry um, so somebody help me body and it's software in a way itself. Is it proprietary, the, what we're made of? Yeah, I mean, and so we have, we have the ability to study it, and this is sort of the, oh, right, so this is what I want to say, is that, is, that, is that this is where, at least in the U.S., we've had these really interesting, and, and in Europe as well, these interesting patent fights. And I have to say, thank you, Europe, for imposing rational policies that now we Americans are benefiting from. But the patent situation is particularly bad because it has in the past sort of conflated these areas where what is naturally our body is then protectable intellectual property. Um, and so there's been a lot of really solid fighting against that and I think the laws are moving in the right way to, to help us. And so I think the main thing is, is that we, we just need to, um, oh, and then we need to be, understand that all software is vulnerable, whether it's proprietary or, um, or, or free and open, and there are, um, there's a project called uh, Open APS, which is an artificial pancreas project, and what they do is they exploit a vulnerability in a in a insulin pump, and they um, and they use that in order to deliver themselves a closed loop system, and so uh, and so it's it's a really really interesting stuff, and it's only they're only able to help themselves because there is a security vulnerability, so it's pretty weird. The whole situation is extremely complicated, and I think we're going to see a lot of uh, a lot of development in that area as we go. Um, I think that our bodies, just as, as, if, as we're mapping what we see around us, our bodies must, all, whatever is observable must be, we must protect that information in, in the interest of the public. Cool. I think we'll just squeeze this question okay, in here. Sorry. Is there any sort of communication <clears throat> between the device manufacturers to get devices to communicate? So, for example, somebody with a pacemaker and an insulin pump could have them communicate and work out which one is actually, go or whether they can work together. And if there is such an, a, a communication between manufacturers, could the routine started by the artificial pancreas people um, be used to start to crack open the rest of the medical device system? So I mentioned that insulin pump uh, uh, initiative because it's, it's pretty great because it's patients taking control um, and that they're basically taking control of the pumps that are in their body. So these devices are all talking to all kinds of things. So, uh, so if you have a defibrillator, many people have this like black box that sits on their night table um, and it communicates with their defibrillator. Um, and, um, and it's handy for people who are uh, not like me, who have need, need to rely on their device a lot more for, for treatment or who are in more dire shape. And so their um, information is sent to their doctors who can then monitor whether they have an issue or not. Those devices, um, St. Jude had, had a, a brand of them and they were shown to be completely vulnerable. And using those devices, they were able to deliver a fatal shock to, uh, to, uh, to patients. And so these devices, all of them are, are built with, uh, with various connectivity and they're talking to all different kinds of things, um, including um, now insulin pumps that talk to phones directly. Um, and so uh, what I'm excited to see is we're seeing a lot more patient engagement. As more technically savvy people are getting these devices, we're all engaging and the device manufacturers are only now starting to open up to the idea that they can work with us. Uh, but I think it is happening, so I am very optimistic. Yeah. Oh, um, thank you very much, and We're out of time, but come talk to me. Yeah, come talk to her. She's around in the conference. <laughs>